Good morning. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, August 2nd. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, as Mississippi students return to school this week, a focus campaign begins to reduce teen vaping. Then Dr. Thomas Dobbs reflects on two policy issues that became high profile during his tenure. Plus, helping barbers help others. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Teen vaping is on the rise. The American Lung Association is reporting a 73% increase in the practice among teens since 2016. And as the new school year begins, it's partnering with local organizations on prevention campaigns. Sandra Shelson is the executive director of the Partnership for Healthy Mississippi. She tells our Rhonda Dunaway the need to reach teens about these health issues goes back decades. We were one of the very first youth prevention programs for tobacco. Uh, started here in Mississippi in 1998. So, yeah, we've been occupying this space for a while. And then the evolution of vaping um, obviously came on, and we had to uh, sort of alter our approach. But it's still very much the same thing. And with vaping, it's actually more addictive, uh, I think, than tobacco because uh, you can get such higher levels of nicotine in vaping devices. So we have been working in the vaping prevention business for a while. Um, We have a large social media presence uh, with the programs that we do and, um, and then also work directly with youth across the state of Mississippi. Now, tell me what that looks like, um, like what type of outreach or social media programs is um, Healthy Mississippi up to uh, these days to combat this problem? Well, we have always believed that you can't have an adult-created uh, message for children or for youth. Um, you know, no no offense to Mrs. Reagan, but the Just Say No campaign, um, you know, that. If that worked, we wouldn't have any problems with our kids. So, um, you know, you've got to listen to them and you've got to meet them where they are. And then you have to ask them, what is going to resonate with you? And more importantly, uh, I think you have to have them talking to each other. Um, If you have a message message that is delivered by uh, an adult to a room full of kids, versus, uh, say, a senior in high school talking to a bunch of ninth graders, who do you think is going to be more successful in getting that message across? So, you know, that's the kind of thing that you have to be particularly careful with and cognizant of as you are um, creating and exposing you to these, uh, these, these messages. Uh, we also have been very fortunate over the last few years to – Um, have programs that are paying more attention to the fact that when kids vape, it can be very difficult for them to quit vaping. A lot of that has to do with the fact that there is so much nicotine in these devices. Perfect example. The nicotine in a pack of cigarettes is 20 cigarettes. If you go to uh, a convenience store and you buy a disposable vape device, say like a puff bar or something like that, It's that one device is going to have as much or more nicotine in it than that entire pack of cigarettes. Um, recently, uh, I believe they were trying to um, outlaw flavors in vape um, because it makes it uh, makes the, um, the cartridges and the nic- nicotine in vaping Highly addictive. Um, do you feel like that the um, flavoring in any way is geared toward young people? Absolutely, and and you're you're right. Uh, with the device known as Jewel, uh, they did close that down. The problem is is that uh, there was a loophole, and in the loophole. That's where these single-use devices uh, have kind of popped in. And uh, 
And as far as were they marketing to children with their flavors, well, how many adults do you think care about a Fruit Loop flavor? What, that's that's obviously directed at at a kid. Um, so you know, yes, that is what they were doing. That's what they have been doing is trying to entice our kids. It makes it more palatable going down. It makes it harder to detect that a kid is using it. And then because of, uh, as we already discussed, the higher level of nicotine, that kid is going to have to have a harder time. You know, if they, they use it enough, they will become addicted to it at a faster rate. I've been shocked by the ages at which, you know, the kids are... With vapes, it appears that they are a much younger uh, at a much younger age getting addicted. Can you speak to me about that at all? Um, is there an issue there at, with a certain age group or what? Um, you're right. It it has been rather shocking. Um, you know, when we started at the partnership in 1998, the high school smoking rate was in the 30 percent. And over time, we were very fortunate with the programs that we used and the partners that we had throughout the state to drastically cut that. And then when the vaping devices came on uh, the scene, we started seeing, you know, the the decline in the use of uh, traditional tobacco products. But with each year, the vaping devices that just continued to rise, and the the age at which these kids were initiating, you know, their first use of the vaping device was getting younger and younger. And, you know, when we've talked to kids about it, a lot of times the first time they ever have a hit on one is a friend. It is definitely something that the trend has been younger age kids, um, they, they get involved with it, and then their their bodies are just so not prepared for the onslaught of the nicotine and then the the addiction happens. Now, the surveillance, the surveys have also shown that at one at one point the uh, trajectory goes from vaping to switching to traditional tobacco. So there is so it's like we've come full circle in some ways. So it is a very bad epidemic. It is something that we all need to pay attention to, um, and, you know, we, we don't really 100% understand exactly what all of this is going to mean in the next five years. You know, we, we had so much data with uh, tobacco, and, you know, the vaping has been around now for, for a while, but not nearly enough to have the longitudinal data that we had with tobacco. Sandra Shelson is the executive director of the Partnership for a Healthy Mississippi. Coming up, Dr. Thomas Dobbs reflects on two policy issues that became high profile during his tenure as state health officer. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. It's time for the Mississippi Book Festival on Saturday, August 20th. Visit the State Capitol in Jackson from 9 to 5 p.m. and visit inside the Rotunda on the first floor. The MPB Kids Club will be ready with Ed Said, PBS's Molly from Denali, plus activities and giveaways. Join Mississippi Public Broadcasting for adventure in both body and brain at the Mississippi Book Festival on Saturday, August 20th. More info at mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The coronavirus pandemic response may have been the most public-facing challenge of Dr. Thomas's time as Mississippi State Health Officer, but it wasn't the only high-profile issue his office faced and his name encountered. In part two of our three-part discussion with the former head of the Department of Health, we talk medical marijuana and the landmark Supreme Court case that bears his name. It is a huge distraction, and, and, I, and I do hope that the, the state of Mississippi and the leaders can recognize what public health is, right? So um, we have a pretty limited bandwidth, and it's hard to hire good folks in Mississippi, right? I mean, it's, every industry is, is looking. And if, if say, there's 10, good thing, 10 things that we can do well with the talent pool that we can attract to work in state government Mississippi, if you add other things that we have to do, 
it's going to push out other priority zones, right? I mean, our priorities in Mississippi need to be advancing maternal child health. It needs to be fighting sexually transmitted diseases. It needs to be um, fighting hypertension and early deaths from strokes, heart attacks, obesity, diabetes, um, those sorts of things. And, you know, there's, there's only so much that an agency can do. And we, we have a very talented team, and we do phenomenal work. But we really need to be allowed to focus on those things that are going to that make Mississippi healthier and more prosperous. Since that is not the case, are you concerned that all of those things that you mentioned are going to fall by the wayside as this program is um, trying to get up and running? Well, certainly it does worry me that, that it's going to be a distraction um, going forward. But we have a great team, and um, you know, I, I, think, I think it's going extremely well. But I, I do not want to let us lose focus, um, having to fight le- le- you know, political battles at the Capitol over the minutia of marijuana regulations when babies are dying needlessly across the state every day. Moving on, this is the issue of the day. It's been the issue for the past, I guess, 50 years, abortion. And as you know, the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, and they did it using Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban, which was uh, challenged by the state's only abortion clinic. And that case bears your name. As state health officer in that capacity, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. So forever, your name is going to be associated with this case and bringing down legalized abortion. What are your thoughts? Well, my thought is I think it's really good for folks to understand that um, that they stuck my name on it, but I wasn't involved in the case, right? And that's just it's just the the quirk of the naming convention because of sovereign immunity laws. And this case, this same case, had my predecessor's name on it before, right? It wasn't actually initially named this way. It was named Jackson Women's Health versus Courier. And when they appealed it, then it reversed directions. And that's why, you know, the Dobbs name is before that. You know, I'm just trying to make sure that people understand that to disassociate the naming of this ruling from me as a person and from my family, because I had no role in it. I was not involved in the litigation at all. Have you received any backlash from people who don't understand that and, you know, think that you were out front on this? Yeah, so I got a, I've gotten a couple. Um, There's a, a, a doc in um, in Virginia who was really mad because his name was Dobbs, and he asked, "How dare I do it?" And I just explained it to him, and he was very apologetic and just understood, you know, that this is a a burden that um, I really didn't ask for, nor did I want, as far as like the linkage to to this. So now, as a result of Roe v. Wade being overturned, we're hearing slowly about cases in which doctors are reluctant to handle miscarriages or situations where a patient's health um, is potentially at risk because of overturning Roe v. Wade. What are you telling physicians? Your thoughts on that? You know, we haven't been actively engaged with with, um, the physicians, but certainly as we go into this new era, the political structures are going to have to give more clear guidance and protection, right? Because the way that some of these are written, they were written with without a real anticipation that it was going to happen so rapidly. And so it does create a vacuum. It creates a void. And to really protect the the lives of, of women, there needs to be some absolute clarity so that docs can move forward with safety. Yeah, because some are afraid of being penalized. There's the doctor in Indiana that the attorney general is investigating because she performed abortion on a 10-year-old rape victim from Ohio. So it's it's kind of scary right now. You know, it, it is scary, and I just hope that as we go forward, we can just be compassionate to everyone. Life is complicated, and um, I know that our, our, our current law, you know, says um, that, um, you know, has to be you know, rape that's um, – I think that's the one that, you know, if it's documented in police. But, you know, a lot, a lot of young women are abused. Um, about one in ten, one, one in, in, in eight women or teenagers report um, being forced into sexual situations that, that are, are coercive. And so, you know, life's complicated. I hope that we can go forward in a compassionate manner, understanding that um, we need to do everything we can for, um, for, for young women so that they can have the best opportunity for success and safety.
And on that same vein, where does the agency stand on birth control? Because there are concerns that that is the next frontier politically. How will people be able to get it? Will the agency make it available? Will they say it's important for health care? Yeah, you know, so fortunately, it does appear that the um, uh, leaders of the state have recognized this as an important reproductive health uh, component, right, having access to reproductive health services. Uh, At the health department, we've been doing that forever. We still provide reproductive health services um, of of the full complement. We also have a lot of partners. Um, Converge is a new partner who's going to be taking over the federal Title X grant, working with partners in community health centers, and other, you know, docs across the state. So, you know, we do need to do a better job about making sure that our kids are prepared to enter into adolescence and adulthood, right, so that they can make good decisions. But also when circumstances warrant, they have access to those services they can to do proper uh, reproductive planning. Dr. Thomas Dobbs began serving as state health officer in 2018. He announced his departure from the post in March and left the agency last week. In the third and final installment of our conversation. Not only do we not have equity, we don't have equality. Um, Until we can have opportunity for all, a a real robust robust opportunity for success for all, we're going to see these problems. We take a closer look at the state of health care in Mississippi. That's tomorrow. Coming up, helping barbers help others. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It's made possible in part by contributions from podcast listeners. Please consider making a contribution by going to the Donate Now tab at mpbonline.org. Thanks for your financial support. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. It's a pretty common scenario. A client enters the room, gets offered a chair, and over the course of an hour or so opens up about life. It's a conversation rooted in trust and when people are familiar with one another. It's very important. It's vital. It's extremely vital that we have important conversations about life, about mental health, about what's going on in each other's lives so we can have that, uh, that uh, weight unburdened off of us. That's Christian favorite. He was one of many who gathered at the Jackson Convention Complex yesterday, training in mental health support. But he isn't a psychologist or social worker. Favorite is a barber at Hunter Phillips Salon and Barber. You have everyone at some point goes to see a barber. Everyone at some point is going to go see a stylist. Everyone at some point, it, I mean, you, are go, so you, me, someone is going to go see someone to get their hair done for some event at some point in their life, and it's going to change their life. It, no matter how minute it is, it's going to change their life, and, and, and hopefully, like, the information that we learn here help us change people's life for the better. The mental health support training is part of a partnership between the Jackson Heart Studies Community Engagement Center and the Confess Project. Darnell Rice shares Project's mission with MPB's Kobe Vance. The Confess Project is a national grassroots organization where we specifically train barbers to be mental health advocates. We're building a culture around mental health and access. And also, we, what we do is we make sure that black boys, black men, and their families are represented and that we, we make sure that they're at the forefront. What role do you see as um, barbers having in the black communities in Mississippi to be able to help address mental health? Well, the thing is the barber and the stylists are the sheroes and heroes of the community. The barbers and stylists are very influential. They have power. They have influence. But most of all, 
They're key gatekeepers for the community. They provide love, guidance, support, but also they provide you know, compassion. They provide love, but they also provide support in the community. Because as you know, during COVID-19, really impact our barbers. And um, what is some of the advice y'all are giving your barbers today to be able to have those tough conversations? Just having those conversations around mental health and making sure that it matters. Uh, we teach on four principles, active listening, positive communication, validation, and reducing the stigma. Because we know the barbershop is very key in, in our communities, and the barber is trusted. Barbershop owner Damien Porters works with the organization Barbers Reaching Out to Help Educate on Routine Screenings, or Brothers. They helped organize the event. Porter says this effort is another in a series of community-based health interventions. It means everything to me because, one, we're highlighting things that I deal with on a daily basis. I got three young men, three young sons. I'm a barber. I coach football. Uh, went to college in a fraternity. I'm always around brothers, especially African-American brothers, man. And we always talk about our mental issues and certain things that we have going on. And one of the main things is we don't want to we want to make sure that our children, our next generation, is able to heal from it and not relive the same traumas that we uh, have dealt with or that they're able to deal with them when they come along. So learning how to acknowledge, learning how to actively listen and help people heal from those uh, situations is very important. And then also being in a barbershop setting, you're always being encountered with people who have trauma. And it's, it's beautiful to have someone to sit back and give you tips and give you resources on how to better help those in your community. Can you tell us a little bit about y'all's involvement in this program today? Okay, well, the Jackson Heart Study, basically, uh, we, we, we did it in conjunction with the Confess Project. So uh, today is mainly about the mental health in the, in the, that we come across in the barbershop. So, uh, but the Jackson Health Heart Study is a program that we started with pre-COVID where we were doing blood pressure screenings in the barbershops and helping African-American men identify hypertension, high blood pressure, especially for those who don't go get regular checkups. So it, it ballooned from internal health to now we're working on physical health, uh, well, mental health. Can I get your thoughts on the importance of being able to give them the tools to be able to have these difficult conversations? Yeah, um, uh, this is very important, and I'm ecstatic that we have a program put together to give these tools because there's so many people that come through our chairs, come through our businesses that we want to help. And a lot of times we don't know what we're going to be hit with, but to be that much more prepared when someone comes in and they confess or allow, uh, uh, they, they're vulnerable and allow you to hear something that's on their mind, and you're able to put them in, point them in the direction of resources, or even now that you're trained or acclimated to how to talk and how to listen to them to make their trauma, to help them heal from their trauma. That's, that's one of the best things that could have ever been done here. Experts say that one in five Mississippians experience mental illness each year, and around 42 percent of adults in the state experience symptoms of anxiety or depression. This has